So today's on the laboratory diagnosis of infectious disease, we're going basically from the 19th century all the way through to the 21st century in one lecture. So we're going to look at how we use the lecture, uh, how, we, how we use the laboratory to diagnose infection uh, and the kind of approaches that are used routinely in microbiology laboratories. Uh, we look at some rapid methods, and at the end, we're going to talk about high throughput sequencing, which is a particular research interest of mine. So, the first point, though, is when we come to diagnose infection, we don't actually start with the laboratory, we start with clinical diagnosis. So, taking um, a, a history of the illness from the patient, examining the patient for clinical signs and symptoms. All these things are important in actually framing the diagnosis and coming up with potential diagnosis before you actually use the lab. Then, of course, there are other kinds of investigations you can do that aren't actually microbiological investigations. So taking a chest x-ray, in this case here, will reveal whether the patient might or might not have tuberculosis. Uh, you can do hematology, where you look at say whether there's a high white count in the blood, which would be suggestive of an infection somewhere. You can look at biochemistry, so you might find in someone who has um, liver disease that their liver function tests are abnormal, or liver, if they've got an infection in the liver. <coughs> but if we're actually looking at using the laboratory to diagnose infection, what we, we do is we get that the phys physician who suspects that infection will collect samples of tissue, fluid, and these will be analysed for microbiological investigation. Uh, there may be immunological investigations done, and more recently we'll start using molecular biological techniques to uh, analyse these samples. And uh, some of the samples, the kind of examples we'd be looking at here, blood. We take a sample of blood, we call that blood culture. Uh, we put that into a special blood culture bottle, urine, faeces, uh, sputum, there should be a break there, cerebral spinal fluid, and pus, all of these are potential um, samples that we can take. We can take biopsies from tissues as well uh, and investigate those. So it's important to recognise that the effectiveness of, of laboratory diagnosis of infection depends not just on having the latest way of actually processing a specimen, doing the test, but on this whole workflow. So it's important that we collect the specimens correctly. Those are then taken to the laboratory and <coughs> checked in. They're processed in the lab. The tests are done. There's interpretation of those test results. And then there's a report generated and getting the report back to the right individual, to the person that actually can make a difference to the patient. Sometimes it's difficult. It's not always straightforward. Uh, uh, but if the report, however well you've done the test, if the report doesn't actually reach the right, per meet the, reach the right person and influence management, then you might as well have not bothered to do that test. Uh, so all of these things are important in terms of the diagnostic workflow. So if we're looking at uh, using the laboratory properly, then we have to take all this into account. The, the old adage, garbage in, garbage out, applies to laboratory diagnosis as, as applies to many other things. So these are kind of questions that we, the, the medical microbiologists, ask the clinician on the ward uh, before they actually start looking at a specimen. So is, is that investigation that they're doing worthwhile? I mean, do you know what you want to find out? I mean, if you, if you really haven't got a clue, just, just test it for infection. You know, it's not going to be very fruitful. If you say, I suspect this patient might have Legionnaire's disease, that's far more useful to the laboratory. Now, it might surprise you, but often the information is already available. A uh, patient might have had a urine sample taken the day before, and you just have to go and look up the result, rather than say, oh, this patient might have a UTI, let's send a sample off. If you check, you might find that the diagnosis is already there. Big important question, really, is does, does what you're doing affect patient management? Are you going to do anything different when you get the results of that test than what you would have done otherwise, or are you just doing it because you're being defensive, or you're playing safe, or you're just curious? Uh, you know, kind of, it'd be interesting to know, wouldn't it? Uh, 
Well, in these, this day and age where everything, there's a price associated with everything, a cost associated with everything, you know, it's very difficult to justify, oh, I just felt like doing it. You really have to say it's going to make a difference. And you know, then you have to say, well, can the lab actually tell you the answer to the question you're, you're asking? So if you have a patient who you might have, suspect might have uh, TB meningitis, you might take a CSF. If the lab tells you not found any acid fast bacilli, it doesn't actually tell you that this patient does not have TB meningitis. Because we know that it's notoriously difficult to actually see and even isolate the tubercle bacilli from a patient who has TB meningitis, and you may have to take multiple samples. So it's important, really, to, to, to take all these things into consideration. And in fact, in the UK, we have a medical microbiology uh, diagnostic service that includes people who are trained as doctors who are able to tell you uh, about the best uh, kind of specimens that you can take, the best uh, tests that you can do, how to take those samples properly and so forth, how to interpret the results, uh, so that actually using the lab is, is, is done optimally. It's also important that when people use the lab, they actually do provide the lab with as much information as possible. So if they let the lab know that this patient's already on antibiotics, then the lab may take additional steps to try and recover a, a microorganism. If they know that the patient's had recent travel, they might say, ah, so this could be something else that we're not the commoner garden things, but maybe we should be looking for brucellosis in this specimen if they've just come back from holiday somewhere where brucellosis is common and so forth. Special risk, you know, if the individual's a veterinarian or a farmer, they may have got a disease they've caught from animals. Uh, all these things can help. So in fact, there are a lot of things that can go wrong when we're trying to make a diagnosis. We have to get those specimens obtained and handled properly, obtained from the site of infection, uh, taken aseptically. Sample size must be large enough. So as I mentioned, for tuberculosis, wherever it occurs in the body, it's often very difficult to make a diagnosis because you require lots and lots of clinical material. Um, and if you want to, say, diagnose tuberculosis of the urinary tract, then you take um, an er what we call an early morning urine, which is basically the entire volume of urine that's voided first thing in the morning by the patient. So maybe several hundred mils of urine has to be collected. Uh, and you have to do that probably three times before you can really say that you've done the best you can. Um, and another problem is that the metabolic requirements for the organism have to be maintained. So many organisms will die very quickly. Anaerobes, for example, die very quickly uh, when they're exposed to oxygen. Uh, so if you want to recover anaerobes from your sample, then you have to put it into a transport medium that will allow uh, those organisms to survive. Similarly, things like uh, the gonococcus uh, or the meningococcus, these will die very quickly at room temperature. Uh, and so you have to take that into account. So uh, when people go to the uh, clinic for sexually transmitted diseases, infections, they will, um, in the clinic, they'll often plate out those samples straight away onto plates and start incubating them to optimize their chances of recovering uh, the gonococcus from the sample. So a whole range of things listed there. I mean, if you go up to a patient on the ward and say, can you spit in this pot, please? You want them to provide a sputum sample. They'll do what most people do. They'll just spit some saliva into the pot. That's useless. You want sputum, the horrible mucky stuff from deep in their lungs before you can actually diagnose what's going on in their lungs. Uh, but if you see saliva sent to the lab, it's, it is, it's, it's useless. We get overgrowth by contaminants. So uh, clumsy house officer, a bit ham-fisted, can't really take blood very easily, will end up making several attempts to contaminate the, uh, the top of the bottle or the end of the needle. And we're very commonly in those situations, we'll grow skin organisms from the blood culture, and they may swamp whatever was there. If there was some precious, delicate bacterium, one cell of it in there, it just gets swamped. Uh, I mentioned insufficient sampling. And also, if patients have received antibiotics, the antibiotics, if you take urine from someone who's received antibiotics, the antibiotics will still be in the urine, and they'll still be active and killing bacteria all the time uh, after you've... 
taken the urine. So all these things have to be taken into account. Another important issue is safety in the clinical microbiology laboratory. This is one uh, area of laboratory medicine where there is a risk to the patient from the samples they're receiving. Uh, so, sorry, not to, there's a risk to the laboratory staff from the, pa uh, from the samples they're receiving. Um, and so we have to be very careful in the way we handle uh, these organisms and we classify the laboratories according to their containment potential or bio, bio safety level uh, through from BSL-1 where you're only handling organisms that have no ability to cause disease in humans whatsoever through to the more common BSL-2 which is kind of the normal lab setup, BSL-3 when you're handling tuberculosis and then BSL-4 as you see here is only in very specialized laboratories, only a handful, two or three in the country uh, that can handle things like Lassa fever, Ebola virus, and so forth. So, when the lazy house officer, or should I say busy house officer, uh, wants to ask for a microbiological investigation, they just scribble MCNS down on the form. What does MCNS stand for? M MCNS stands for Microscopy, Culture, and Sensitivities. And that very largely summarizes the traditional approach to the diagnosis of bacterial infection. So we look down the microscope, uh, either with a stain or without stain, and I'll say more about one particular stain, a gram stain, in a moment. We culture the organism, we try and get those bacteria to grow on, on agar plates or in, solid, or in um, liquid medium, and then we try and determine what their sensitivities are or susceptibilities are to antibiotics. On top of that, we have these immunological approaches, serodiagnosis, serological approaches, and now we have DNA technologies, of which more later. So when we're looking at microscopy, we can just look down the microscope at an unstained preparation, uh, a so-called wet prep, um, and this can be done. Uh, you can look at some urine, and you can see whether there are lots of cells in there, particularly lots of neutrophils. You can see those, and that tells you, are there pus cells in the urine, there's inflammation in the urinary tract, it's likely to be an infection. Uh, for syphilis, if you have a patient with syphilis and they have this primary lesion of syphilis known as a chancre, you can actually scrape some of that material off and suspend it in, in, in liquid and look at it down the microscope. And what you do there is you illuminate from the side and the light is then scattered upwards into the microscope. This is so-called dark ground illumination. And what you see, you don't really see it here, you should have, we should have a movie if we're going to show it to you properly, is you see these spirochetes, very thin organisms, spiral organisms, uh, and they are swimming around very, very quickly. So they're quite distinctive, very easy to see uh, using that kind of approach. So it doesn't require any staining. Most of the time, though, we do rely on stains. Um, and we have a number of different approaches in our armamentarium. The gram stain I'm going to speak about in a moment. Uh, we mentioned before t tuberculosis is unusual in that that organism doesn't stain with the gram stain. We have to use what we call acid-fast staining, where we apply um, the stain and then we try and leach it back out again with acid. And in almost all organisms, the acid is enough to acid and alcohol together is enough to leach out the stain, apart from uh, the organisms that cause TB. And we can then use um, fluorescence approaches as well as an alternative. So I, I think you probably had teaching on this before, but just to reinforce the learning, this is the gram stain. We start off with a crystal violet and grams iodine applied to your sample. You then try and decolorize with acetone. And for many bacteria, this actually leaches the stains back out again, and they become colorless. Uh, those stains, uh, th those uh, bacteria that where they lose the, the, the stain are called gram negative. Those that retain the stain because they have very thick cell walls, particularly the peptoglycan in the cell wall, these we call gram positives. Now, if we left it at that, just with decolorization, we would just see the gram positives, and the gram negatives really wouldn't be very easy to see. So we counter stain afterwards with a, a different strain like, a stain like methyl red or safranin sometimes used. And then we end up with a situation in which the gram positives appear purple and the gram negatives appear pink down the microscope. In fact, when we look down the microscope uh, after the gram stain, there's one other 
uh, major uh, difference that we see, and that's the shape of the, of the bacterial cells. And we basically divide them into uh, what we call cocci, spherical cells, uh, or we divide them into bacilli or rods, the rod-shaped cells. And so we can, to the first approximation, divide the bacterial universe up into these four quadrants here, gram-positive cocci, gram-negative cocci, gram-positive rods, and gram-negative rods. Now, it's also worth stressing that we can use the gram stain in, in two different contexts. We can use it directly on clinical specimens to actually visualize what's actually in that specimen. So here you can see some urethral pus from a patient that's got gonorrhea. And you can see these little dots there. Those are the gonococci. Those are the bacteria that have stained up as gram-negative diplococci. Uh, in this particular, we call them diplococci because they usually come in pairs. And you can see that directly in the clinical sample. The alternative approach is that once you've isolated the organism as individual colonies and you've got it growing in pure culture, uh, you can take a sample from that colony and then you can gram stain that. And that will then allow you to identify, will go some way towards identifying that organism. So if you had a pure culture of E. coli and you did a gram stain, this is the sort of thing you'd see. Now, I mentioned before that the gram stain is not used for full bacteria. We mentioned mycobacteria as one difficult set of organisms. Spirochetes, we've also mentioned, the ones that cause syphilis, Treponema pallidum, and so forth. They can't be seen with the gram stain. You have to use that dark field. And there are some bacteria that live inside cells, very specialised intracellular bacteria. And again, those are not well visualised by the gram stain. But to the first approximation, the gram stain works for most bacteria and allows us to chuck them into those four different baskets. We culture bacteria. And we can culture them on two different kinds of uh, media. We can use solid media, uh, so we can use agar plates, or we can use slopes. So agar plates, as you can see here, you have a Petri dish, you put the agar in it, it solidifies. You can add all sorts of things to the agar, so it acts as a kind of matrix to hold nutrients and indicators in the matrix as well. And the agar plates allow us to both identify the bacteria, because we can look at the uh, colonies, we can uh, isolate the colonies and so forth, I'll say more about that in a minute. It also allows us to enumerate the bacteria. So we can work out from the starting inoculum, we can count the number of colonies and we can say there are this many colony forming units in that starting inoculum, and then you can work out how many there are uh, say, per, per mil of the starting material. We use slopes, we've mentioned this before in the TB lecture, for things like TB, because it will dry out if we left it on, a, on, a, on an agar plate and also because it presents a hazard. I mentioned blood cultures already as well. Blood cultures is another special case where we're really trying to ramp up the sensitivity. So if we find that even a single cell in a blood culture sample that cell, if put into liquid medium, will overnight grow up to make that medium uh, cloudy, will give us a signal, uh, and, and, and we will be able to recover the organism. Uh, and so for that uh, uh, maximum sensitivity, we, we actually use a liquid medium in that circumstance. Now, it just so happens, very fortunate, that most pathogenic microorganisms, the bacteria, can grow overnight. So we slap up the plates and we come back the following morning and we can read the plates and we can say, ah, oh, this is what's there. There are some exceptions. Anaerobes, as we mentioned before, anaerobes are, can be difficult to grow. Not only can they die easily, but they, even when they do grow, they can sometimes take a, a few days to grow or even weeks. Um, mycobacteria, we've said already, grow very slowly. Uh, Treponema pallidum, the causative agent of syphilis, you can't grow it at all on agar plates. It just doesn't grow. Uh, similarly, Mycobacterium leprae also cannot be grown. Um, and there are these ob the obligate intracellular bacteria, the Chlamydia and Rickettsia, also can't be grown on plates like that. They have to grow in cells, in cell culture. And so when we're trying to bring in molecular methods, those are the, the targets that we look at, first of all, these difficult organisms. Uh, and, and, and it's not surprising that that's where molecular biology is made. It's, uh, first inroads into the bacteriology lab. When we're looking at the kind of media that you can uh, grow things on, there are a variety of different uh, media, kinds of medium that you can use. 
general purpose medium, uh, you can have enriched media uh, that will, you know, say you can add blood to the medium, which will allow certain organs to grow. You can what we call chocolatize the blood. You can heat the cho heat the, the, those blood plates up so that the red cells lies and contents are released. That's very good for some bacteria. Uh, you can put selective media that only support the growth of some organisms, uh, and some media will have indicators in that will allow you to differentiate between different kinds of bacteria. So here's a, an example <laughs> of that. If we use a, a, a medium called McConkie agar, it's got an indicator in there, and it's also got lactose. And if the organism is a lactose fermenter, the colonies and the surrounding agar will go pink like this, this deep pinkish color. Whereas if they're non-lactose fermenters, it just stays the same background, this kind of washed out kind of orangey sort of color. Um, so once we've got organisms growing on solid media, we can actually then look at the, the colonies we see. We can look at the size of them, the shape of them, the surface characteristics, whether they're dry or moist and so forth. Uh, and this all gives us, gives us a clue as to what kind of organism we're dealing with. It also gives us a chance to isolate the organism in pure culture. And so this is where it's very important that we obtain single, cult single colonies. So each of those colonies that we see there is the result of a single cell landing on that agar plate the day before and then growing up overnight to form millions and millions of cells so it becomes a visible colony. Um, and if we actually then pick that colony and spread it out onto a second plate, we then get that organism in pure culture. So it's, we can then keep propagating it. Uh, and it's generally the case that to identify things using conventional tests, you need them in pure culture first. As I mentioned before, you can also count the number of colonies and get some kind of quantification of how many organisms there were in the starting inoculum. And in some areas of microbiology, that's important. So, for example, in urine microbiology, when we want to diagnose a urinary tract infection, we, we have to know not just what's there, but how much of it's there. Because if it's there in abundance, then it's much more likely to affect infection than if it's there uh, scantily. Now, we have a whole lecture on the identification of bacteria. Once you've got them in pure culture, we can look at the morphology and gram stain and colonies, growth requirements, whether they grow aerobically, anaerobically, what kind of media they grow on. We do all sorts of biochemical tests. Uh, this was a very popular uh, sort of test that w when I was starting out in microbiology, so-called API, where you have a number of cupules there with reagents in them and various indicators, uh, and you make up a suspension of the bacterium, and then you apply it to each of the cupules, and then you incubate for a period of time and come back and see. So you'll see in some cases you've got a blue color, some cases you've got a yellow color, the yellow color suggesting that it does actually ferment that particular uh, carbohydrate, the blue it doesn't. And looking at those patterns of biochemical reactions, you can then come up with a, a, a fairly solid identification of the bacterium. Some bacteria produce enzymes, produce antigens as well that are important. Um, here is hemolysis, as it's called, where on blood agar you can see clearing of the agar around colonies because red cells are being broken up by diffusible toxins coming out of the colonies. And we differentiate between at the top there, non-hemolytic uh, bacteria, uh, what we call alpha-hemolytic, where they break down the, the blood, but don't break it down fully, so you're left with the kind of greenish pigments released from the hemoglobin, and then complete hemolysis, or what we call beta-hemolysis, where you get such a clearing of the blood agar that you can actually kind of read a newspaper through it, you can hold it up to the light and see you straight through it. These two tubes here will illustrate the principle of the coagulase test, which is used on staphylococci. Here, um, staphylococcus aureus produces an enzyme that will clot uh, citrated plasma, whereas other staphylococci, particularly the ones commonly on your skin, the so-called coagulase-negative staphylococci, will not do that. And so these are the sorts of tests that we do. When we come to the next, so we've done M, C, and now S, we do sensitivity testing. We can do this on solid medium, or we can do it on, on, in a liquid medium. When we're doing solid, uh, working with solid media, 
The most commonly used approach is the so-called disk diffusion test. So what we do here is we make a lawn of the organism on the plate, and then we apply a number of disks. And those disks, uh, made of filter paper, will be impregnated with a standardized amount of the antibiotic. And that will diffuse out into the agar uh, overnight as, as you incubate at 37 degrees. And when you come back the next day, if the organism is sensitive to that antibiotic, there will be a zone of clearing around that uh, disc. If the organism is resistant to the antibiotic, and you can see there's a couple of examples here, you will get growth right up to the disc. It's not quite as clear cut as that because you sometimes get a reduced zone um, such that there is a little bit of inhibition, but it's not considered uh, significant enough clinically for the drug to be useful. So uh, it, it, even with a small zone, uh, the drug, it may be considered resistant to the drug. And uh, if you're going to standardize this, uh, then you should actually measure the zone sizes uh, in, in millimeters, and they can be compared to various standards. Uh, and when this, uh, this test is done properly, you basically standardize everything, and you control for everything so that you get reproducible results uh, using this kind of approach. And so it's a very quick, straightforward approach, uh, and you know, visually fairly easy to score as well. This is uh, a more sophisticated approach. Uh, so the manufacturers of this test, the E-test, what they do is they make a gradient of the antibiotic along this strip. So at the top there, you have a very, very high concentration of the antibiotic. As you get towards the lower end of the strip, the, the concentration has steadily gone down. And it's so carefully standardized that you can actually read off uh, a, a numerical figure here, which is effectively equivalent to an MIC, which I'll explain in a moment, uh, uh, from where the zone of inhibition actually transects the filter paper. So in this case here, we'd be reading that at somewhere around 0.125 or 0.094, maybe even, it's quite hard to read, but uh, that, that kind of level. The definitive test for uh, susceptibility testing is the so-called MIC test, or Minimum Inhibitory Concentration Procedure. And what you do here is you take um, your antibiotic and you make doubling dilutions of the antibiotic uh, in the in, in appropriate growth medium, in appropriate broth. So here you might have eight, you're going for a liter of four, two, one, whatever. And then what you do is you add a drop of culture to each of those, and you incubate them overnight. Now, at the highest concentrations, the antibiotic will inhibit the growth of the bacterium. Um, and the uh, tube will stay uh, completely clear, even after overnight culture. But there will come a point in that doubling dilutions there where the antibiotic is no longer capable of inhibiting uh, the growth of the bacterium. Um, and so you can see here, at one milligram per litre, we are now starting to get the organism growing through uh, that, back, uh, that uh, antibiotic. And so what we do is we score the MIC as the tube above that one, the last tube that remains clear. So in this case, it's two milligrams per litre. Okay, moving swiftly on to viral infection. The whole range of approaches we can use for viral infection. Traditionally, people used to use the electron microscope, although that's pretty much going out of fashion. We use various antigen and antibody detection approaches. You can grow many different viruses in culture, but uh, by and large now, most labs are moving towards molecular methods, variants on the, on the, the polymerase chain reaction to detect viral DNA or RNA in samples as the primary modality of, of actually testing uh, whether the organism is there or not. There are a whole range of immunoassays that you can do. Uh, so you can take um, someone's blood, take serum, and you can measure the antibody titer uh, against the antigen produced by the pathogen. Um, and 
you can uh, do doubling dilutions and you can work out where does it stop reacting and, and have a measurement that way. And there are various approaches, won't go into detail. There are various T cell based tests. We mentioned with TB in the past, you can do skin tests. You can now do these laboratory based methods as interferon gamma assays, which are more sensitive than the skin tests and more specific as well. Um, so there are all the, those kind of approaches. I'm not going to say more about that. Here's one example of uh, using a glu an agglutination approach where you actually uh, can stick antibodies or antigens onto uh, insoluble particles, latex beads, for example. Um, so here is an example where you have a latex bead agglutination test for Staphylococcus aureus. It's not projecting particularly well, but in this one here, which is number one, you've got a smooth suspension of those particles. Nothing much is happening. In number two, where you've added some Staphylococcus aureus, uh, that suddenly causes all those uh, particles to, to clump together as they get cross-linked with these uh, immunoglobulins on the surface, and, and that clumps down to give you a clear, a, a very straightforward um, reading that, yes, this is uh, positive in this particular test. There are a number of rapid approaches that people are, are uh, pioneering at the moment um, that mean that it's quicker to get to the result of, yes, we have a positive uh, uh, test result here. Um, so you can measure various uh, things that reflect the growth of microorganisms, say in broth culture. So two common methods. One is to use ATP bioluminescence uh, to, to actually determine uh, whether there's microbial contamination in pharmaceuticals. And in clinical labs, we often detect the production of carbon dioxide uh, in, uh, say, blood cultures. Uh, there are a couple of different methods for doing that, back to, back to alert. Um, you can also uh, look for various components of microbial cells. Uh, and you can identify bacteria, for example, Nowadays, very, very, a lot of interest in using mass spectrometry to take a colony and just put it through the mass spectrometer, and you get a profile, and then you can look that. You don't know what each of the peaks are, but you can just look at the shape of that profile and compare it with uh, a, a reference set of profiles and give a very rapid identification. Um, we also have a great deal of interest nowadays in nucleic acid base technologies, DNA probes, molecular typing methods. Uh, I mentioned PCR, which is part of a generic group of, of what are often called nucleic acid amplification technologies. So you can use alternatives like ligase and so forth. And you can do sequencing. Uh, you have various automated methods for detecting growth. So if you take blood cultures nowadays in a hospital, they get put into a special instrument where they get incubated, but they also get checked uh, regularly. They, uh, uh, they go through and, and they, there's a check for growth in each of the bottles. And so you may have hundreds of bottles sitting in there, but the instrument will flag one of them. As soon as it actually detects growth, it will say, you know, bottle in row A, uh, column number three, the bottle is now positive, and then you take it out and subculture it and do gram stains and so forth. Here's a fa fairly recent development of the, the Vitec 2 system. It's a fully automated system for bacterial and fungal identification and antibiotic susceptibility testing. Um, so you have these sealed cards that are used, and you apply the uh, a culture of the microorganism. It gives you a very rapid identification on the same day antimicrobial sensitivity testing. So this is where you you have these cards and you get the result, you plug it into the instrument and it will have this advanced expert system that will look it up and say, okay, so that profile of, anti of um, biochemical tests means that this is 99% likely to be E. coli or 98% likely to be Staph aureus and so forth. So basically so you're removing humans from the loop, replacing humans with machines. Uh, we mentioned this one before, the expert uh, MTB RIF approach, where you have uh, a sealed cartridge and you just do this extraction of DNA. Uh, it just, in two hours, it will give you a result to say, yes, there is mycobacterial DNA present, and actually uh, the RPOB gene that's been amplified is or is not likely to be associated with infanticide resistance. Okay, the last five 
or 10 minutes of the talk, I'm going to now look at something that is really completely new. Uh, just in the last couple of years, uh, we've been using these kind of approaches, and they're still in the infancy. But this is, I think, the, the way we're going in the 21st century. And that is to use what we call high-throughput sequencing. So high-throughput sequencing is actually uh, uh, sometimes called next-generation sequencing. It's a generic term for a, a range of technologies that allow you to sequence DNA at least 100 times faster and at least 100 times cheaper than was possible, say, five or six years ago. And in fact, we're probably talking thousands of times faster and cheaper now, or maybe even tens of thousands. Uh, and these technologies, instead of doing what you used to do, which was to take uh, templates that you grew up in, a, say, an E. coli, you grew up a plasmid, or you grew up a, a phage in the E. coli and prepared template from that. With these approaches, everything's done uh, chemically. You're in, uh, in vitro, you're growing up molecular colonies, if you like. And there are lots of new exciting chemistries that are being used. I'm not going to go into detail. Here in Birmingham, we've been doing this for a couple of years now. This is a blog posting from one of my bioinformaticians. And you can see just how nerdy we are, particularly how nerdy he is. As he says here, he was anticipating today like a kid waiting for Santa Claus. What could provide such excitement? Nothing less than a brand new 454 DNA sequencer. Uh, we've had, presumably had lectures from Charles Penn at some stage in your career. He's looking a bit like a lemon standing next to that crate as the sequencer arrives, but there we are. And there is the sequencer itself. And so what kind of things can you do with this? Well, you can detect pathogens, you can detect differences between pathogens, um, and you can find out more about what makes pathogens tick, the pathogen biology, using these kinds of approaches. Basically, we can cleave our approaches into two major classes, the culture-dependent and culture-independent approaches. So we can still grow things up on agar plates, and we can pick colonies like we used to, like we always have, and then we can actually prepare DNA from those pure cultures and sequence the genomes of those organisms. So we get whole genomes from the bacteria that we've isolated from the clinical samples. An alternative approach is sometimes known as phylogenetic profiling, where we actually amplify up a molecular barcode that's present in all bacteria, the so-called 16S ribosomal RNA gene. Um, and because we, we basically amplify that using primers based on conserved parts, but that, that between the conserved regions, there are variable regions, and we can then use the sequence of those variable regions to actually assign the organism uh, to a particular taxon. Uh, another approach um, is to just sequence what all the DNA that's there. That's uh, sometimes called metagenomics, where basically, say you took a sample of pus and you just extracted all the DNA from it and just sequenced all that <coughs> DNA. You didn't try and work out what bacteria are there first. You didn't try and amplify anything. You just sequenced everything. So how about these approaches? Well, this is actually a, sort of a bit of a going slightly to one, angle, to one side, this is these approaches used in virology. So in virology, it, you can actually um, do what we call metatranscriptomics. You can actually, say, take RNA from uh, a sample, and you can make cDNA, and you just sequence that cDNA library. And, and the thinking here is, OK, you're going to get lots and lots of human genes coming out. But if the patient's infected by a virus, one in 100,000 sequences might be from the virus. And this approach has actually now been amply shown uh, to, to work uh, in, in, in the clinical setting. So there are at least uh, these three papers here where new viruses have been discovered just by this brute force approach of just sequencing uh, the cDNA that's been isolated from the patient. And having discovered the viruses in these papers, some of them they've gone on and then devised, because uh, you could think, well, it's a lot of effort to sequence all that, hundreds of thousands of sequences, but once you've got bits of the genome of the virus, you can then make specific tests, very specific serological tests or PCRs that are much simpler to, to use uh, in the future. These kind of approaches also coming into bacteriology. This is a recent paper that came out a few months ago where they looked at wounds and what was living in a wound, what, what, what organism, what bacteria were in the wound. 
and they use conventional culture-based approaches of the sorts of things I was talking about earlier, and then they use this approach of molecular barcoding and high-throughput sequencing, and they found that actually it did make a difference to patient outcome. If they looked at the molecular uh, approaches, which were more sensitive, and then got their treatment harmonized with what they were finding there, they found they got a better outcome than if they just relied on culture alone. Another interesting area has, has been the birth of genomic epidemiology for bacteria. So now we can isolate those colonies, we can sequence the genome. We can do that from patient in bed A, patient in bed B, patient in bed C, and we can then start to try and work out who gave what to whom, where did they get their disease from, and so forth. So there's a, here's the first cluster of papers that came out on this topic. Uh, we've seen... Uh, more of those more recently in the last few months and, uh, or so. Uh, one of these, the first one there, these kind of approaches were used to investigate the so-called Emerithrax incident. So some of you may remember that there was a deliberate release of anthrax into the American postal system back in 2001. And um, this uh, genome sequencing approach was, was used to actually get a signature characteristic of the of the cultures of the sport from the spores that were found from the postal service, and we, you, we, this approach was then used to tie that into a particular culture in one particular individual's lab, and basically point the finger at that individual. The individual committed suicide, so it's never gone to trial, but they closed the investigation uh, on the basis of that evidence. There are political ramifications of these new technologies, so. Turns out that the Haitian cholera outbreak, which happened a year or two ago, it didn't originate from a cholera strain that was found anywhere in the Caribbean or in Latin America. When they sequenced the genome, they found that actually it was close, most closely related to strains that were circulating in South, Southern Asia. Uh, and in particular, uh, the finger was pointed that Nepalese peacekeepers, that the UN, had actually deployed in Haiti after the earthquake. So this had quite a lot of political ramifications in Haiti that these guys are coming to help them, but are actually giving them cholera. Not, not on purpose, of course, but it nonetheless created a, a bit of a hoo-ha. I'll just put this last, I hope you'll indulge me for a few more minutes, we've still got a couple minutes yet. This, this one here about zoonotic leprosy, this, uh, I think we, uh, no, we haven't mentioned this before. This is uh, uh, an instance where... Um, they sequenced the leprosy bacillus genome from a variety of different uh, leprosy isolates uh, from around the world to look at single nucleotide polymorphisms, differences between them, and they showed that the, the human isolates um, could be made in some kind of phylogeny, and they also found isolates from the only other organism that gets leprosy. Does anyone know what the only other organism that gets leprosy is, any other animal? kind of pub quiz kind of thing. The nine-banded armadillo is the only other organism on the planet that, that gets leprosy. And they get it naturally. They're infected in the United, southern United States and in Mexico. You can go out and you can find armadillos that have got leprosy. And the question is, where do they get it from? Through this paper, uh, through this analysis report, this paper, they actually were able to show beyond any doubt that the, the armadillos actually had caught leprosy from humans. So all of the armadillo leprosy uh, genomic signatures were a subset of the American leprosy kind of uh, signatures they were seeing. There was a final twist in the tale as well, though, because they could then also find a few cases where humans had been in contact with armadillos and had got leprosy, and they were able to show that those humans who'd been in contact with armadillos had leprosy bacilli that had the same, very same signatures genomic signatures as, uh, as those found in armadillos. So humans in the distant past, 100 years ago or more, gave leprosy to armadillos. Armadillos are now, now giving it back to humans. You get strange people in the southern United States. They go and skin, you know, capture wild animals like armadillos and skin them and eat them. Or they get roadkill and eat it and so forth. Those individuals are getting leprosy. So be careful what you eat when you go to New Orleans. I'm going to just give you one little vignette from our research. We study an organism called Acinetobacter baumannii, which is a gram-negative bacterium. It's multi-drug resistant, and it's associated with wound infections, pneumonia, in ventilated patients, gets into the blood. Particularly a problem here because we receive all of the soldiers that come back 
from Afghanistan and we used to get them back from Iraq. Uh, and they all come here and this particular organism has, has, has been associated with those military personnel. So we had an outbreak here in 2008 and we had a, a number of isolates indistinguishable by current methods and we genome sequenced them and to cut a long story short, we basically genome sequenced six isolates and we then determine single nucleotide polymorphisms and single base differences between them uh, and check that very carefully and came up with three loci where they uh, were distinguishable, only three loci in the whole genome, and these were the profiles we saw. We basically worked out what the ancestral state was by looking at a completely unrelated Acinetobacter, AB0057, uh, and then uh, looked at them uh, as derivatives from that. Now, when you look at it this way, it doesn't really tell you anything very much. M stands for military, so those are four military patients. C stands for civilian. But if we uh, actually look at the uh, time and space elements of the outbreak, what we see is we have most of the patients in this six bedded unit in the intensive care unit, then this main intensive care intensive therapy unit, and then a trauma unit. Uh, so one patient went from the main ITU into the six bedded unit. Um, the trauma unit patient had no contact with any of the others. But if you look, there's this TAG genotype here, and you can see one patient here, it spreads uh, from, uh, it, well, there's one patient here, M2, in an adjacent bed to C2, both with the TAG genotype. The only other patient that had the TAG genotype is this M4, which had no contact with them at all. So what we assume, what we predicted from the, on the basis of parsimony, was that there was a transmission event from that patient to that patient. How do we explain M4 then? Well, it turns out M4 and M2, both soldiers, they both came back through the same care pathway from Afghanistan, came back through the same uh, field hospitals, came back in the same helicopters and so forth. So we're assuming that they actually, uh, one of them uh, infected the other, or they both got infected from the common source before they actually came into the hospital. Anyway, I'm pretty much nearly finishing now. So I'm just, I just like to big it up for genome sequencing. Uh, it's the area we're working in. It, it really does help us uh, find out more about how bacteria are spreading, what makes them tick. And a, a recent development is that we now have these so-called big benchtop sequencing platforms where they're you know, about the size of a laser printer, an instrument that can sequence the genome for a few hundred pounds or m maybe even less uh, within a few hours. And so we really are seeing this moving towards clinical ap applicability. If you're interested to know more about this kind of stuff, then we uh, wrote a review which came out last year uh, about the opportunities and challenges associated with this field. Um, more recently, I wrote a review, uh, a kind of opinion piece that was published in Genome Medicine. Um, in fact, that's not open access, but I actually was allowed to put it on my blog as well. So we Got a blog, there's a blog post there if you're interested to look at some of the, I mean, I've been rather simplistic and said it's all wonderful. There are some, quite a lot of caveats about applying these technologies, and if you want to know more, you can read that. So, in the 19th century, we used to use culture and microscopy and so forth. Towards the end of the 20th century, people started using molecular approaches like PCR. I think in the 21st century, we're going to start seeing genomic approaches applied much more widely. Uh, so that's me finished.